and I want to start out by sort of giving you an overview of how JavaScript fits in to um, the equation here. So far we've studied uh, two languages in this course. We've studied HTML and CSS. And just as a reminder, this should be review. HTML is responsible for the content of the page. So you have your text, your links, images, um, anything that relates to the content and sort of the logical structure in addition to the content. In other words, this is our navigation section, this is our header section, this is um, an article about some topic, this is another article, this is a footer. So content and I will say logical structure. CSS relates to the appearance. and the actual physical layout. So in HTML we might define a list of links in a nav section. CSS will go and say, well I want that nav section to be, uh, take up 100% of the screen and I want it to be blue and I want the links to be white and, and so on and so forth. All right. JavaScript is a third piece of that. And JavaScript has what I'll call behavior or interactivity. That's the main role that JavaScript performs. And it works together with the other two. Anything that you can define on a web page you can set something up on a web page and define it and define the HTML tags, define the attributes, things like the source attribute for an image, for example. You can also define all the CSS stuff. So you can define the color, you can define um, the font, you can define the size of the text. All those things you can define via CSS. Any of those things you can change via JavaScript. All right. And you can even add new stuff or get rid of stuff. So in a nutshell, you can change anything about the pages, HTML and CSS through JavaScript. What's important about that is you can change it based on a user action, right? I mean, we wouldn't write JavaScript just to change a link just for the heck of it, right? We would, we would uh, write JavaScript to change a link or to change the appearance of something or to change some other attribute of it when the user does something. So there's interactivity. And by interactivity, I mean the user does something and the page responds. A good example of that, there, there's a lot of good examples of that that we can see on the web. One of them is just making sure that it's doing what, it, what I want it to do. Yeah, there we go. It, it's funny, these days it's very hard to find controversial, uh, websites that are not controversial, <laughs> you know. So I'm not even a sports fan, but I always use ESPN as an example for this, just because it, it's something that is at least a little bit uh, smaller chance that there'll be something controversial that, that we'll spend the rest of the class arguing about instead of talking about JavaScript. All right, here's an example of JavaScript. Here's this page, all right? This page is done with HTML and CSS. Now the interactive part relates to as the user puts their mouse over certain navigation things. So as you put your mouse over the NFL, boom, you get that to appear. So the page has changed. All right, based on the user action. That's what I mean by interactivity. 
The user does something, the page responds to it. And it responds to it specifically without going back to the web server. That's sort of the important part. And I'll draw a diagram uh, about that uh, in a minute. But put your mouse over something, boom, the menu appears. Put your mouse over that, the menu appears, and so on. Kind of a spoiler alert here, those menus are there all along. All right? All those menus get loaded when you initially load the page. What is also loaded is the code to show and hide them. So all they are doing in the JavaScript is when you put your mouse over a link, we're changing the CSS attribute to say, instead of not to display it, to say display it. So that's all we're doing, uh, not all word I didn't write this, but all they're doing in the code here is when you put your mouse on it, it's making it appear. Yes? That's a good question. The browser is smart enough to know uh, if your mouse is on a particular element. And, and we'll, we'll review how, how that can happen. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the browser is smart enough. You can, you can put code on each thing to say, when your mouse is over this, do something. All right? So and we'll, we'll look at examples of that uh, in a minute. Those are called user events. In other words, how does the browser know that I've clicked a button? How does the browser know that my mouse is over here? How does the browser know that I, that I typed a key? You know? um, all those things are things that um, um, there are things called events for. And we can write code for those events to do something when the user does something. Uh, so we can respond to what the user does. All right. So. One of the keys to this is this all happens on what's called the client side. JavaScript is also called uh, client side scripting. And I'll talk about what that means right now. All right? <clears throat> we talked about how server side scripting works, right? We have someone running the browser, our user. This is sometimes called the client. All right. They are connected to the internet. And they make requests to a web server who may be running some server side scripting. And that may be connected to a database. And so I go and I request a page from ESPN. All right. Um, and it responds, the, the web server does its thing. It runs all the server side scripting. It looks up the most recent scores from the database. It forms the HTML page and it delivers back a page that contains HTML and CSS, a standard web page like we've been talking about all semester. But it also includes some JavaScript code to do the interactivity. So this is the result when we first load the page. This is what it looks like. Now notice, if you look down along here, it's smart enough to know that we are probably, um, being that we are in you know, north central Ohio, that we'd be interested in the Cavaliers. We theoretically, at least, would be interested in the Browns. Uh, we're interested in the Indians. And we would probably be interested in Ohio State. Um, that, again, is part of the server-side scripting. Um, the server-side scripting, when it gets your request, it gets a bunch of stuff. So if you entered anything on a form, which we didn't in this case, but our IP address, which can translate to our approximate location, all these things come over when we make a request to the server. The server can take all of these things into account in its script when it's accessing the database and figuring out how to form a page custom for us. All right? And so it responds as such. Now, thing to keep in mind, this trip through the internet 
to make the request to have it go through the internet, whatever path it takes, and come back. This trip takes a long amount of time. At least the way that computers measure time. All right? It doesn't take long, because I mean, look, how long does it take us to, to get this page if I hit refresh? You know, a second maybe, two seconds. All right, so that's not a long amount of time in people terms, right? But in computer terms, that's a long amount of time. All right? So therefore, if we think about these menus, if the browser would have to go and request, make a new request to the server to display the NFL menu or the NBA menu or anything like that, that would take a long time compared to what can run on my computer here. So if I deliver the code that can control whether the menus are show or are hidden to the browser, and that can run right in the browser without making this long trip to the server and back, all right, um, then it's a, it's a savings for everyone. It's a t great time savings for the user because they don't have to wait for all these things to happen. It's also a great uh, savings for the, uh, I'm sorry, it's a great savings for the client because they don't have to wait for the server to um, get the request and do something with it. It's also a great savings for uh, the server as well, because the server isn't bothered by these little requests all right, that would take up its time. The server handles sort of the heavy lifting, things like looking stuff up in a database all right, and that sort of thing. That's, the ser that's what the servers uh, need to do. These little things like displaying a menu or hiding the menu the code in the browser can do that just as well as the server code can do it. That's small potatoes, right? That doesn't take a lot of processing power to do that. So your machine can do that just, uh, uh, just as well as the server can, and it can do it quicker. So that saves you the time of waiting, and it also saves the server from having to worry about these little piddly requests. Now, we're on a very fast internet connection here. If we were on a slower internet connection, it would be even more dramatic. All right. Um, so the idea is, is we're going to send JavaScript code here to do some small but important things that relate to changing the HTML and CSS that will result in changing the appearance of the page. And it's a win-win situation. The client gets their response quicker. They don't have to wait for the server to respond. Uh, and the server doesn't have to worry about these small little requests like display this menu. No, wait a minute, display this menu instead. No, wait a minute, display this menu instead. All right. If you had to wait for the server to respond, something like this wouldn't really be practical. Because I'm going and I'm moving that, and it's changing it as quick as I can move the mouse. So it doesn't have to go to the server to do that. It already has the code loaded, and the code came with the web page. And all that code is doing is it recognizes that I put my mouse on something, and it's changing the CSS or HTML related for that. All right? So let's look at an example. Let's look at a smaller example than this. All right? Let's write a web page with spoilers on it. Okay. So let's go in the notepad. And I'm going to make a web page.
Let's do Star Wars spoilers. And in this example, I'm going to put my CSS right in my HTML code. Again, an external CSS is always better. So, in one of the movies, we find out who... Luke Skywalker's father is. I mean, technically this is a spoiler, but I would assume everyone in Western civilization probably knows who the answer is, of course. And of course we know that Yoda is Luke Skywalker's father. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, it took a second, but yeah, that's, that's right. All right, let's go and save this as an HTML file. Well, obviously, if this is a spoiler, we wouldn't want it to show right off, right? We would, we would want, uh, you know, we, we would, we would want to, like, hide it from the users unless they wanted to see it, right? So... So, if we were to look at this, well, boom, we got the spoiler showing and everyone's mad, right? So, let's hide it. How can we hide it via CSS? How do we make something not visible? No, that's a, that's a comment, all right? The comment will make it so that it's not really HTML. So you're, you're right in one respect. It wouldn't show, but um, that wouldn't allow us to change it from visible to invisible. We can actually put CSS in to make stuff invisible. Does anyone know how to do that? Maybe you remember this from the mobile section. There's, yeah, there's actually two ways we can do it. We can set visibility to hidden, or we can set it to um, display none, all right? I'm going to use display none, because visibility hidden uh, simply, well, I, I, I guess it doesn't matter which way we do it, but visibility hidden makes it invisible, but it still takes up the space. So you'd see a blank space where it was supposed to be, where display of none um, shows it um, uh, doesn't take up the space for it. So you'd have to decide, do you want the blank space or not? I guess we could do it either way. Now, I don't want all my paragraphs to be invisible, right? That would kind of be a blank web page. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I have to identify this particular paragraph. Now, I might have more than one spoiler on this page, right? Maybe this will be a list of, of Star Wars spoilers. So I'm going to create a class for spoiler, all right? And I'm going to say visibility equals hidden. All right. So visibility is hidden. Now I have to identify what the spoiler is. All right? Because this isn't a spoiler. This is a spoiler. 
and the person can choose if they want to see it or not. All right? So I'm going to do that by saying class equals spoiler. <coughs> All right, so now I have that. I'm going to also make the, the, the font size bigger so that we can see it. One of these movies, we find out who Luke Skywalker's father is. And we have to have a way to make the spoiler appear. And we can do this a couple different ways. All right? I'm going to create a dummy link. All right? We could create a button. Uh, but I'm going to create a, uh, normally I would create a button. Uh, but since you asked about how does, the, how does it know when the mouse is over it, I'm going to create a dummy link to show you how we know that. So I'm going to create a link. Here. And I'm just going to make the href go to the top of the page. And I'm going to say show spoiler. So this is as far as we could go with this with, with HTML and CSS. We have the content of the page defined. We have set the appearance of the page the way that we want to. Now we want the interactivity. The interactivity is going to be JavaScript. All right? There's a few different ways we can do this. All right? But the idea of interactivity is the user does something and the page responds. Now, in this case, um, the recipe for this sort of interactivity is this. The user takes some action. They click on something, they put their mouse on something, they type something. Any of those things are user actions. Now, these aren't the only ways that you can trigger, trigger JavaScript. But these are the most common. These are the most, most basic, all right? That something happens where the user takes an action. So they click, they point their mouse, they type something on the keyboard, or the most typical ones. Associated with these are what are called events. And the easiest way to do events is to make them an HTML attribute. And events start with the word on, and then they have something else after it. So the event that says when you click on a link, uh, or, or when you click on a button, rather, it would be on click, because you click on that button. The event when you put your mouse on something is on mouse over. OK? There's a whole list of events that you can write code for. And here's a list of them, JavaScript events. On change, on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, on load. Really, all of them except maybe on load, you would say, correspond to the user doing something. I guess on load is if the user requests a page after it finishes loading, you can trigger things to do. Can you make no. No, you're, you're, you're not, now, yeah, you're, you're stuck with those. But those are typically enough to make, uh, I, I can't even imagine. There, there's events to handle just about anything that you'd want to write events for. Um, like Twitter, for example. Twitter, what, originally what, you had 140, now you have, what, 280? 
Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it shows you a countdown of how many characters you have left. All right, that's a JavaScript event. You press a key, it figures out how many characters there are and how many, character, how many characters you've typed already, how many characters you have left, uh, and it calculates how many you have left, and it displays that. Okay. So I'm going to say on mouse over. <coughs> equals. Again, there's a lot of ways to do this. This is the most straightforward way to do this. So that's step one. There's a user event. Number two, we point to the thing we want to change. How do we point to things on, the, on, on our page? Uh, pardon me? <laughs> no, no, th we have to do this through code. Yeah, it would be, yeah, it, yeah, that's the one we want to change. All right. Uh, we have to do it through a code, and, and again, keep in mind that this is a rule to do simple JavaScript for interactivity. More complicated JavaScript is just more stuff, more steps, all right? So in JavaScript, you might actually point to a bunch of things on the page and do a bunch of different things. But here, we're doing something really simple, so we're going to point to the one thing on the page we want to change. How do you point to the thing on the page that you want to change? There's something called the DOM. And DOM stands for Document Object Model. And that is the way that we reference stuff on the page. All right? And there's one instruction that's going to be our workhorse here. All right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, in order to point to, to one specific thing on the page, Typically, we want to point to one specific thing on the page, like in this case. Imagine if there was a whole bunch of spoilers here. We wouldn't want to point to all the spoilers. We would want to point to this specific spoiler to show it. Imagine if there were, again, 20 spoilers here. All right? We wouldn't want to change all 20 of them. We'd want to point to this one. All right? So. There should only be one thing that we point to, typically. All right? How do you point to only one thing? With an ID. Right? A class doesn't work, right? because a class would allow us to look at all the things. Now, sometimes you do want to do that. Let me rephrase that. But in this simple model of changing a single thing on the page, you want to point to one thing on the page. And the way to point to one thing on a page is to use an ID. Remember, an ID has to be unique, all right? An ID identifies something on the page precisely. In other words, there shouldn't be two things on the page that have the same ID, all right? If there are, then it's a problem, all right? It's a problem because you, you, in JavaScript, you're not going to know which one you want to point to if two things have the same ID. It would be like if two students had the same student number. Which student gets credit for the course when they pass? What student gets the bill? All those things you wouldn't know because you just have the ID, which of the two. So you have to, it has to be unique. So I'm going to give this an ID of spoiler one. Seems like a good ID. And on mouse over, what I'm going to do is. I'm going to point to that using the workhorse, which is document get element by ID. Inside the quotes, you put the ID that you're interested in. So in this case, it would be spoiler. One. That's the expression to point 
to that thing on the page. The thing on the page that has the ID. Now, here's something about JavaScript. HTML, as languages go, is very forgiving. All right? What happens if you use a tag that doesn't exist in HTML? Nothing, really. I mean, the browser will try to display it. It probably will treat it like a paragraph tag. Right? It probably will just show the text without causing an error. It's not going to blow up. All right? It's not going to stop the whole page from loading. It'll just make the best of the situation. And if there's something it doesn't understand, it will ignore it. All right? And therefore, if, you, if I added a goofy tag on the page, it would probably just display as regular text. JavaScript isn't like that. Additionally, JavaScript is stricter because it is case sensitive. So the document get element by ID needs to look exactly like this. Lowercase d, lowercase g, all right? This is what's sometimes called camel case because the first letter of the word is not capitalized, but then the first letter of let me rephrase that. The first letter of the first word is not capitalized, but then the first letter of every word after that in an expression is capitalized. So documents the first word, dot. Get element by ID is the first word of this part of it. Or, or dot, get element by ID is the next section. So G for get is lowercase, then E, B, and I are capitalized. This is sometimes called dot notation. And what we're really doing is we're zeroing in on the specific thing of the page that we want to change. Document means we want to change something on this web page. That's what the document part means. OK, I did something wrong. There we go. Document means on this page. You can actually write. JavaScript to change stuff in other windows. So you could, it doesn't, it isn't always document. But document means something on this page. Get element by ID points to the element of the page that we want to change. So in this case, it would point to this thing. So But there's more. I sound, like, I sound like I'm doing an infomercial here. But there's more. All right. What about it do we want to change? All right. We could change any number of different things. We could change whether it's visible or not. Well, that's what we do want to change. All right. We could change the font size of it. We could change the color of it. We could change several of these things. We could change the text that appears there. All right. So we have to zero in further. Every time we put a dot in there, we're zeroing in further. We start out saying we want to change something on the page. What do we want to change on the page? Something that has an ID of spoiler one. What do we want to change about it? Something about its style. What about the style that do we want to change? We want to change the visibility. And what do we want to change the visibility to? We want to change to visible. Good observation. I'm going to make this smaller, and I hope you can still see it. The HTML attribute on mouse over is enclosed in quotes. So there's the beginning of the on mouse over instruction. Actually, I did that wrong. It should be there like this. The quote says that this is the beginning of the JavaScript statement. This is the end of the JavaScript statement.
I use double quotes to indicate that. Therefore, I can't use double quotes inside these. If I tried to make these double quotes, guess what the browser is going to think? It's going to think that that is a JavaScript statement. It's going to see that quote and say, ah, double quote means the end of the JavaScript statement. So I get around that by using the single quotes inside of it. So I use double quotes to go around the whole thing. I use single quotes inside the expression when I want to um, um, use quotes within there. So in this case, I want the ID to be spoiler1. And therefore, that needs to be enclosed in quotes, because that's the exact ID that I want to change. Visible, I want to be in quotes, because that's an exact value. These other things are like built-in variables, so they're not enclosed in quotes. So, if I did this correctly, I put the mouse out over, and it displays. Let's try that again. Put the mouse over, and it displays. How does it work? Well, on mouse over, that's one of the events, what am I going to do? Find the thing on the page, look on the page. Find the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler1. Ah, that's this thing right here. What do I want to change about it? I want to change its style. What about the style do I want to change? I want to change the visibility. What do I want to set the visibility to? I want to set the visibility to visible. Again, you have to know your CSS here. Right with CSS, how do you? What's the values for the visibility property? It's either visible or hidden. So hidden means it's invisible. Visible means it's visible. How could we hide it again? Well, the first thing we want to think of is what user event do we want to use to hide it? We could have a hide link. All right, and when we moused over that, it hit it. But it seems to make sense to me that we could put our mouse on that link and show it. We could take our mouse off of that link and hide it again. That would seem to be a reasonable way. So I can put another event here. And it's not going to be on mouse over, because that's what happens when we put our mouse on it. It's going to be on mouse out. And it's not going to make it visible. It's going to make it hidden. So we put our mouse on it. It shows it, we take our mouse off, it hides it. Believe it or not, this is a greatly simplified version, but essentially it's the exact same thing they're doing here. Put the mouse on it. Whoops, I didn't mean to click it. Put the mouse on it, it shows it. Take the mouse off, it hides it. Show, hide. Show, hide. All right. That's a bigger example, but the basic like, train of thought, the basic logic is the same. We have events that happen. The user can put their mouse on it, they can take their mouse off of it. All right. And then we can show or hide. Yes. Now, one thing that's important with JavaScript is understanding how to figure out if something goes wrong. All right? Because as I said, JavaScript is not very forgiving. All right? Let's say 
that, I slipped up and I typed in document with a capital D. All right. This is almost going to be like the validator, right? The validator tells you what's wrong, but it tells you what's wrong in a way that isn't necessarily always the most straightforward. All right. So we have to do a little bit of decoding. All right. The one thing I would say is recognize what the most likely errors are. You know, based on my experience working with students, just getting the names of things wrong is is uh, one of the most common things of error. So like maybe not having an ID of spoiler one, but you know, spoiler um, zero one or something like that. Typing it in wrong. All right, just making a typo. Yes. Oh, no, no, it would not be different at all. Yeah, you just have the link to the external CSS. All right, so I made a, a, a mistake on purpose. And that's the other common mistake, is forgetting that JavaScript is case sensitive. So if I go here and load the page, put my mouse over, nothing happens. All right, why did nothing happen? Well. I know nothing happened because, you know, I know what the error is because I intentionally made it, right? There's a capital D there. But if I didn't intentionally do that, how would I find the error? Well, there, there's different places in different browsers, but almost all browsers these days have an option for developer's tools. On Chrome, you go to more tools, development tools, and you can look at what's called the console. And this tells me what's wrong, but it tells me what's wrong in a very indirect way. I would like it to say, gee, you, you shouldn't have capitalized a D, right? It doesn't tell me that. It does tell me, though, that document get element by ID is not a function. All right? So if you ever see that, that's where you have to think. Do, do I have the word spelled right? Did I, did I typo and spell document wrong? Or is the case right? Ah, yeah, the case is not right. So I can go in here and fix it. Save it. Refresh. And now notice I don't get that error. Another thing that could be wrong is if I didn't get the ID right. Let's say I was mistaken and I put spoiler 01 in. All right. That's going to give me an error, right? Because there's nothing on the page that has an ID of spoiler 01. So I put my mouse over it again. Nothing happens. If I look at the error console, it will tell me it cannot read a property style of null. All right. Let's translate that into English. What that is saying is, again, remember the, the dot notation zeroes in, focuses in on the thing on the page we want to change. All right, document, somewhere on this page. Get element by ID, spoiler one. That finds the thing on the page that has spoiler zero one in, uh, for the ID. Well, guess what? There is nothing that has the ID of spoiler zero one. In computer terms, then, that is null. There is nothing with that ID. And therefore, the style of nothing, it can't deal with it. Can't deal with the style of a null. I can't change the style of something that isn't there. And therefore, that's why we get this error. Again, if we set it right, then it'll work. All right, let's do another spoiler.
and Leia are make the spoiler two, right? Because I can't have the same ID. It's still a spoiler, though. I could have uh, several things that have the same class. Luke and Leia are um, classmates at Jedi Academy. I don't know. All right. Now, I'm going to do this one with a button. I'm going to say input. Type equals button. Now, notice I didn't put type equals submit, because this is not a submit button. I don't want to send data to a server to be processed. I just want to write some JavaScript code. You, don't, you could put on mouse over to the button, but typically what you're interested in is when the user clicks the button. So on click equals. I'm going to do the exact same thing, except I'm going to say spoiler 2. on a button. Show, and then it shows the spoiler. Exactly. A different user event triggers it. Now, I can't unclick a button, right? Like I could take my mouse off of it. So if I wanted to hide it again, I'd have to put like another button. You could, you could do something like that, but buttons want to be clicked, right? So I wouldn't put a hover with a button, even though I think you probably could do that. So I'm going to create a, a second button that says hide that is going to make it hidden again. So I can show it or I can hide it. Now, if you think about this, what did I say like way at the beginning of the class that we can change just about anything? I could actually make that button do both functions. All right? Be smart enough to tell if it's shown or hidden and then make it the opposite. So if it's not visible, I could have the button say show. If it's visible, I could change the first button to say hide, and then write the code so that it, sh it shows it or hides it. So I don't act actually have to have two buttons, but with the minute of class time I had, I, it wouldn't be easy to do that. Well, that'll be something we'll take up on Monday. All right, do you have any questions here? And again, do remember this will be uploaded if you don't get it exactly right. Um, so this is, uh, again, the idea of JavaScript. We can change anything about the HTML or CSS of the page through JavaScript. Um, it's a win for the client because they don't have to make a request that takes a long time to go through the internet. It's a win for the server because the server isn't bothered with these little, small little requests. All right. Um, the recipe for doing it, and again, this is a vast simplification, but the typical things that you do in JavaScript often involve a user event getting the ball rolling, on click, on mouse over, something like that. We use the DOM to point to things on the page, and then we can set their HTML or CSS. All right, so we'll expand on this uh, on Monday of next week. All right, if I don't see you in lab, have a great Thanksgiving. We'll be back at work uh, next Monday. All right, other questions? All right, see you up there.